Today we're talking about participatory action research. Welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 31. Today is March 2nd, 2019. My name is Benjamin Stewart, calling from lovely Aguascalientes, Mexico. Good morning, everybody. This is Fidel Herrera, also here in Aguascalientes, Mexico, enjoying the change of the weather uh, in the last days, and I hopefully uh, expect a uh, uh, nice season with heat, uh, with sun, and enjoying type of... Um, different thing from having the coat on and the boots and the gloves and right now just stripping out a little bit for the head. Man, good morning. Good morning, Pity. Yeah, the change of season when it starts to heat up like this, uh, the San Marcos Fair all comes to mind. Uh, so we know we're getting close to the fair when things start to warm up a little bit. So um, we want to welcome everyone who's joining us here in Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 31. We've been doing this a little over a year, Petey, and uh, we're, we've cranked out 30 episodes uh, this, thus far. And each week we get together, usually each week, uh, Saturday mornings to discuss educational topics, topics that we typically find ourselves talking about throughout the week. We created a Teacher Learning Cast to provide an outlet, hopefully to invite others to join in to the conversation. We have a, a Facebook page if you'd like to join us. And I think the easiest way to reach out to us if you ever want to be a part of the broadcast, which we're always looking for others to join us, is to simply post a message. You can either contact us directly, privately, or uh, publicly send a, uh, a message via Facebook. Probably that's the easiest way to do that. And we'd be happy to join you. So the purpose of really uh, creating Teacher Learning Cast is to uh, invite others to join in the conversation. Uh, we teach at a BA program in English language teaching, and we have a lot of contact with pre-service and in-service teacher uh, teachers, uh, language teachers, and we want to use this vehicle to share some of our experiences and our perspectives. But again, we want to invite everyone uh, to let us know what you think of our topics, if you agree, if you disagree, and let us know. Yes, man, it's been uh, a year. Uh, we already passed a year in this, as you mentioned. We already have, this is episode number 31. And uh, we kind of go back and forth with different topics that uh, I think pretty much is uh, the core of many of the aspects we discuss, and we never finish uh, discussing certain um, key uh, aspects for ourselves in our teaching uh, daily life. Uh, but I think one of the main ones is the sharing part and the discussion, which is the whole purpose of this show. And, uh, and today, I think uh, it's an interesting topic to talk about action research and put it into uh, just a little bit of the example of what we are actually doing somehow and uh, trying to motivate teachers to actually uh, think a little bit beyond what it's done every day because uh, this topic, and correct me if I'm wrong, man, goes mostly for the idea of reflecting constantly on your daily actions and, uh, and do something about whatever you consider as uh, an important moment in your teaching day. Yeah, it is. I think reflection is a key part of this. And I know when sometimes uh, teacher practitioners hear the word research or study or doing some sort of uh, investigative work, it's an immediate turnoff because a lot of times they feel there's a disconnect between research and actual teaching practice. But we want to, um, we want to share this idea of participatory action research today, which is our topic. Um, to really invite and hopefully 
persuade you to to look at research in a slightly different way. I have um, I've been thinking a lot about research this semester because I'm currently teaching a thesis seminar course, which is a research course to eighth semester uh, teacher trainers, and so my my goal today is hopefully to share a little bit about what we've been doing here at the university, but also invite others to show that there are other variations of research that we think that are ap applicable to what you're doing and invite this idea of sharing and reflection, which really is at the basis of all of our discussions here at uh, Teacher Learning Cast. So the purpose here today is to talk about participatory action research and also, Petey, I know you teach and have a lot of experience with uh, teaching in the practicum strand, so it'll be interesting to hear your perspective on, on the role of research, even from a pre-service English language uh, teacher perspective, to see to what degree or how deep can we get into this idea, what are some relevant concepts and considerations to take into account when we discuss uh, and consider this type of research. Right. Uh, why don't we jump in? Uh, and and uh, Ben, can you uh, enlighten us a little bit with uh, what what exactly is actual research? What what are we talking about here? All right. Um, so participatory action research, and I've got some definitions here that I want to share with you. And I think the main point that I want to make here, there's some key words that jump out really that I think make participatory action research maybe different than what many of us may think of as as research. Right, so a minute Ben, for the guys that are watching on Facebook Live, if you click the link above, you can have a better view of what you're actually looking here at the screen and you can have it in first plane and read better. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. And I am going to be sharing my screen, so definitely if you are able to access the YouTube feed, uh, this might be a better uh, experience for you. Um, but I want to, the first definition I want to share with you is actually coming from uh, the field of medicine. And I want to kind of show some of the key words here that are, that are included in this definition. So participatory action research, or PAR, P-A-R, differs from most other approaches in that it, it's based on reflection, data collection, and action that aims to improve, in this, in this case, health and reduce health uh, inequities through involving the people who in turn take actions to improve their own health. So the, the main point here is there is a reflection aspect of part of this research approach, but the data collection piece and the action I think stand out to me. So when we talk about participatory action research, we can look at it uh, in terms of creating some systematic way of using information that we already have. This is really one of the, I think, misconceptions about participatory action research is that many think that, well, we just don't have time. There's no time. We have enough on our plate, so to speak, with the uh, students and grading papers and applying tests and conducting activities, preparing for classes. We just don't have time for this extra piece of work that would be considered research. And one of the main aspects I think that uh, is relevant to participatory action research is, one, it's about your own practice, for one. So it's not necessarily looking at um, someone else's practice, although it could mean that. But it's more about reflecting on one's own practice, finding a problem, finding something that you can relate to that you want to improve upon or simply want to know more about as it relates to your own practice. And then using the information that you already have available. In this case, it could be any data that comes from the students themselves, of course, any lesson plans, things that you're doing already. It's basically looking at that information and analyzing it in a way that evolves around a, a problem, a researchable problem. Yeah, ben, so, yeah. here I, um, I think it's very important what you're mentioning about the extra work or doing something uh, uh, beyond. Uh, 
because uh, whatever it, whatever it takes, maybe uh, a little bit more, or maybe just the same things you are doing, just uh, having a little bit more of organization, whatever it takes to, to organize this information. I think the key aspect in here is that at the end, since we're talking about action, uh, action research, action specifically indicates that you are going to have uh, immediate changes in whatever you are doing. Hopefully, there are going to be um, changes that enhance uh, your daily activity. That means that it's going to ease up your daily work. Yeah, exactly. And, and we can look at uh, PAR, Participatory Action Research, and divide it into actually the three words that make up the term. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at uh, participatory, this is based on your particular uh, actions within the classroom mm -hmm. and, and your problem. For me, participatory can be, again, individually. It can also be throughout a department. So if you're looking and working with other educators, but, uh, PAR can really add significance when groups or communities of teachers are working together towards either individual problems or maybe problems that they have in common. And each individual is investigating and researching and reflecting and sharing that information um, with the community. And again, it could be a community within the school. It could be a, an online community if you're looking at a personal learning network. But there's a, there are a lot of levels or ways in which you can think about your participation. But for me, it's simply looking at something you're already doing. And you know, just as a, as a quick example, I'm teaching thesis seminar. And each week, I ask my students to create a weekly journal. And this weekly journal is their reflection on their progress, where they answer different questions that relate to what do they find challenging, what do they find easy, what are they currently working on, what do they plan, plan on working on in the future. But this is an example where I would ask them to do this type of journal, this type of reflection anyway. If I were to decide to do PAR, Participatory Action Research, in my own teaching practice, I simply would use that weekly journal Again, that is a normal part of my planning and uh, part of my class, but I would use that as data that I would later analyze and uh, report and share with others later on. And so the, the piece here that I think is very important with, uh, with PAR is that you take, you, for the most part, things or data or information, activities, things that you're doing already in your class, and you, you do something with that, you analyze that already. So it's not extra, it's not necessarily creating new questionnaires, although it could, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're new instruments that you're bringing into the, uh, the experience, um, but you know, there's, a, there's a lot of variation on there. But basically participatory, taking in a real problem that you're facing and building some sort of uh, systematic way of collecting data around that particular problem. Okay, yeah, I, I, when you told me we would be discussing about this idea, I looked a little bit uh, for uh, technical information about this and I found a chapter by uh, Anne Burns and, uh, and pretty much she, she's exploring this idea of action research and, uh, but the main thing is that uh, well, one of the main things that I take from, from what I read in, in her chapter is that uh, she leads towards the idea of uh, positive change and improvement by the participant. And, uh, but as you said, it's not about creating a whole new different thing just to have these changes, but starting from the interrelated activities or uh, uh, elements that you have already there in your classroom that are actually happening and and I think just the the concentration in here mainly is to focus more on reflection reflecting of this interrelated happenings or situation experiences that um, somehow interact with each other and what it means is what you are saying the information and the the um, 
what is going to lead us to the growth, it's already there. Uh, so what is it about then? If, if, if everything is already there, well, one of the aspects is the reflection about it. And then how do you deal with this uh, idea of reflection, reflecting on what already is, what in what it's already there? So. Right. Um, exactly. I think, and, and the, the reason I'm bringing up a lot of different definitions, one is that I think it's important to show really the differences in the types of definitions and really the flexibility that is available when you, one considers uh, PAR. Mm -hmm. It's not even necessarily a particular method. It's almost, you might want to think of it as almost a, a way of inquiry a, an approach, if you will, it's not necessarily something very specific, and it can be, you know, tailor made to one's own educational context. But some other key words that uh, that I came across and other definitions here: theory and practice. I think this is an excellent way to merge theory and practice, and this always seems to be when anyone thinks about research and education that there is a disconnect between theory and practice that maybe the the theory, the research that's out and available doesn't relate to everyday real world problems that we face in the classroom. And PAR actually addresses that directly in the sense that we are looking first and foremost at a problem, a situation, or an issue that we're facing that we're either having problems with it's, or it's, it's a challenge. We want to know more about it. That's really the basis, that's the starting point of even beginning to think about uh, a research process that involves collecting data and analyzing it and sharing it with others. So this idea of trying to close this gap between theory and practice really um, is at the root of participatory action research so that there is less of a disconnect between these two uh, ideas. And one of the ways of doing this is to look at your own participation in PAR as both researcher and participant. You are the participant of the research. You're the target, you're, all, you're the subject of the, the research, and you're also the researcher who's in charge of collecting and, and analyzing this information. So it's not, again, it's not thinking in terms of, okay, I'm going to research another individual, another teacher. I am the participant. And so I can, you know, take all those into consideration, all those factors and issues and knowledge that we that you have about your own uh, of your own class, and use that and bring that to the research analysis process, so that more insight, more rich description can be had and shared uh, shared with others. So I think again, this key the key point here is as professional social researchers operate as full collaborators with members of organizations and studying and transforming those organizations. So again, it's really about working together uh, as, as communities of teachers, for example, who are working in one institution that are really forming the way in which the research is there to benefit and to improve the organization or the educational experience that we're offering our, our students. Yeah, Ben, uh, I, I, with all this you're mentioning about the, um, the aspect of being a participatory uh, action research, I, when I talk to my students, my teachers that are in formation, I always tell them that they are already people who, who may not be, I mean, they are students and we are always going to be students, but they also have to start thinking about themselves as preparing themselves for their teaching life. So being teachers already in formation, though some of them haven't actually worked in the field yet. Uh, and my conception of me as a tutor, and this is something I put on the table very often with them, is that I'm just uh, another teacher in formation with a little bit more of experience maybe that, than, than some of them. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we need to be together in the classroom to help each other, and in this case, uh, try to help a little bit more the ones that have less experience. 
So that would be my concept of me as a tutor. But it's the same concept that I have about the authors of books. It's uh, people that have a little bit more of experience because they have already gone through these uh, ideas, these interventions maybe, or these action researches in which they actually uh, look for better ways of uh, having the dynamics or the, uh, the happenings in the classroom level in a, let's use the word better, I don't like that that much, but in a better uh, way than without the information they can provide us. So uh, with this idea, what you're mentioning about participatory research, uh, it's the same thing if you have colleagues around you, if you have people in your schools, if you have other teachers doing interesting things, uh, they may have a little bit the same, uh, to put it in time, the same time of experience that you do, but the experiences in each classrooms are different. So going through this idea of uh, action research and exploring about yourself and knowing about what happens in the classroom level, trying to have these uh, thoughts about it and reflections about it, and then sharing with others about what is going on, or what you are actually uh, discovering or being aware of in your classroom, uh, may lead you to other teachers who got the same kind of experiences, uh, the same kind of happenings, and different paths in which they have dealt with it. And at the end, it's again, the information is there. The, the, all the happenings, all the situations, all the possible, different possible solutions uh, may have already been done by different teachers. And just uh, talking about it with, uh, uh, leads you to a little bit more of awareness and, and to gather ideas from yourself, from what you see in your classroom and from other teachers. Yeah, and, and I keep thinking about this idea of PAR and pre-service English language teachers, right, and who have limited experience, yeah. they're just getting into the field, and, you know, reflection, of course, is a big piece of especially the tutor and trainer relationship, right? So a lot of reflections going on. We're asking our, our uh, teacher trainers to reflect on their on their practice but what does that mean and what are they what are they actually doing and i think that at one level you know you're they're they are taking evidence they're taking information that they're getting whether it's you know just through observation whether it's you know uh, homework from the students watching their behaviors maybe listening to how they speak yeah. And they're making, they're doing a reflection. I think PAR is just taking it to a different level in the sense that they are taking that information and spending more time analyzing that information in order to infer certain conclusions. And so I think the point would be for pre-service teachers is to what degree uh, or to what degree can the reflective process involve as much as possible, this uh, systematic way of collecting information and analyzing that, that information, right? And, you know, to what, how far can that go or how far does it need to go in order for students to make the best inferences, to make the, the best judgments based on what they, what they see? I think the easiest example would be, you know, a lot of times, even with experienced teachers, we think we know what the students feel. We think... We might know that either they're, they understand what, what they're doing or they don't or they like the class or they don't like the class. But sometimes we don't know. We can be misled. Maybe we, we just don't know until we actually either ask them or we have some sort of uh, reflection that we ask them to actually articulate what their challenges are in the class and if they like the class. But we need that data, we need that actual evidence, because sometimes we don't know, we feel that, or we believe that things are going well when maybe uh, maybe they're not. And so this is just a very simple example, but I think the point here is that we many times, I think, can do more. It's not just enough to say we reflect in our class right. without knowing to what degree or what kind of evidence we're actually basing that reflection on. 
Yeah, I think uh, you're you are uh, getting to a very interesting point in here because uh, one thing is what we what we have in our minds, what what we think as an ideal, what we have as a plan, and that may be interfering with our actual appreciation of things. Let me put a, a specific example about this. Uh, my students and sometimes struggle. My or the teacher sometimes struggles with. Uh, uh, the giving of instructions, actual instructions for an activity, or uh, and kind of uh, uh, when they have to explain something specifically, sometimes they struggle because in their minds, they already know what it is. They already have the idea of uh, what they want to transmit. And when they put it into words to explain to another person or give the instructions to another person, uh, it's the information they the, what the words that, that come out of their mouth are influenced by what they previously know or respect or want. So what they say may be a little bit not that clear for the listener, and their students may have a hard time understanding what the teacher wants, because on the other end, the student, the actual learner of the language, uh, first of all, it's uh, it's dealing with a new language. But it's also dealing with, uh, I don't know what you are going to say. I don't know where, where you want to go. And then you put it in words which are already taken into account that there's a previous knowledge about it. Do you, am I making myself clear in here? So that's pretty much, um, I think, what you say in here. Uh, sometimes our beliefs about what happens at the classroom level about ourselves is or has already certain kind of influence from our previous beliefs, our our ideas, experiences, and sometimes uh, it's it's really hard to have a different view from what is going on if you have previous experiences which cause a, a huge impact in you or in your life, and then what happens at the classroom level. Uh, your view of it is kind of affected. So I think the part that you, when you mentioned, what kind of evidence do you have to support that thought or that appreciation about the happening in the classroom is the one that validates that it's actually, uh, and let's call it an accurate thought. Yeah, and and sometimes you know, we get so wrapped up in the teaching that we don't even realize kind of what, what we're doing, right? Unless we have a way of systematically evaluating and getting information about our own teaching practice. Let me give you a few examples. With uh, eighth semester thesis seminar, many times students will choose topics related to L1, L2 in the classroom. So what's the role, if any, of using the uh, L1 or the native language in in the English language learning classroom. So in our, in our case, if our teachers are teaching English as a second or an additional language and they're Spanish speakers, the question is going to become, what's the role of Spanish, if any, in the classroom? Mm -hmm. And so if they are in the practice, and, and you know this may relate more to experienced teachers, I'm not sure if, it, but you may or may not be that aware of the L1 in the classroom, uh, if you're not really in tune to what what you're only what you're doing, because you just you may, you're not paying attention. You're in the moment. You're teaching. You're worried about other things. You're observing students, and you're not. You may not even realize when you're speaking L1 versus L2, unless you do what? Well, it may be you record your your class, and you have that information. This is a perfect example of getting additional information about your practice, in this case, a video or an audio, and then going back and then actually analyzing, all right, how much or how often do I speak in L1? How much time am I spending in L speaking in L1? How often are my students speaking L1 versus L2? How often? When does it happen? There's all kinds of questions that go on that you can analyze through the use of an audio or a video type of recording where you simply just can't, you can't get that same information just by a simple reflection at the end of the class. Even if it's immediately after the class and it's still fresh in your mind, 
you're not going to be able to analyze to the same degree as if you had some sort of uh, video or audio recording. Now, this is probably going to be based around some sort of issue or problem. Maybe the problems are very concrete in the sense that you feel that students are not speaking enough English in class. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, what do I do? What can I do? And this is really the problem. This is the starting point. And this is where, um, you know, the, the act of doing participatory action research relates directly to one's own challenge. This is not some ab abstract research conducted by someone else that you try to have to connect and see how that's relevant to your own teaching practice. This is your issue, your problem, and you design your own process for collecting data and analyzing that data based on that particular problem. So you would have to do some sort of conversational analysis where you actually record and uh, become aware of the discourse between you, the teacher, and your, your learners and really evaluate, okay, what am I doing? Uh, am I giving instructions, for example, in English or Spanish? Am I starting the day at the beginning of the class, speaking one language over the, over the other? Is this the best way? Should I try something, something else? Uh, how are the students reacting? All these other very detailed types of questions come into play that are very relevant to the inquiry and the analysis of this example of L1, L2. And my question, Petey, to you would be like, if you, if this came up, and this may not be the perfect example because, you know, maybe you're asking or requiring your learners not to speak L1 at all, right? But my question would be like, how can you take something like this uh, to a beginning teacher, so one that doesn't have a lot of experience, how can you bring in the PAR experience as much as possible to shed more light on what they're doing uh, in their classroom and so that they can turn that into a learning experience, not only from themselves, but also an opportunity to share that with others who also might have similar challenges or face similar problems? Uh, well, this is... Let me tell you a little bit what happens every week in every different class I teach. All of the classes I teach are related to the practical strand. So we go some semesters on observation. At the same time, I'm working with um, uh, teaching workshop. Uh, and, and at the same time, I may be working with uh, full practice for, for higher semesters. This semester, I'm working with teaching workshop one, which is the beginning of teaching and assistantship. The students are already assisting a real teacher in their classroom. And what happens in all these levels is that, that I tend to talk about the same things with all of the students in the different levels. The, the difference in there is uh, how deep you go into it and how much you really explore the same kind of topics. And this beginning that you are mentioning, how do you begin, this is, this is the beginning, the middle, and the end, and this is the everyday talk. Uh, how do you make, uh, how do you help teachers to be aware of what's going on at the classroom level? I found myself uh, with, uh, with the key aspect that you need to understand uh, before getting into the why's and the when and the how, you need to be able to even identify what is it that becomes relevant to think about? The, the main what? I mean, and this is just a starting point, but it takes a while for students, for, for the teachers in training, that um, it takes a little bit of a while to start, let's say, discriminating, to start discriminating about uh, what is that I want to explore? What is that urge me to understand? And what is it that I'm not even aware of? Katie, can I, can I jump in real quick? Because I'm curious yeah. about this piece, about the thing that they are to focus on. Yeah. Can you talk about how that comes? Maybe you're, you're leading into that. But I'm, I'm curious, does this relate to the problem that they face? Let's say they have, I, I don't want to say weakness, but let's say you know that they have a, something that they want to work on that they know that they can, can improve upon. How does that come into the conversation? Do they identify that? Do they recognize that? Or is that, does that emerge through conversations that you have uh, with them? 
I don't even have to tell them to look for their weak point or whatever they're struggling with because I don't know in other parts of the world, but here in our context, we are so used to punishment and and, and crime and, and, and I mean, it's, it's something that I've talked to them openly in this sense because I don't need to tell them to look for their weak spots. They immediately go for that. And, but I'm, that's not my focus. My focus, I found, um, and it also comes from medicine, which is uh, the field in which they work a lot on reflection. Uh, a lot, a lot, they, they have a lot of information about reflecting. And I found myself with the idea of critical incidents. And I think you've heard me talk about that before. And that's the what. And that's, uh, I don't talk about uh, good things or bad things, uh, I tend to talk about effective things in the classroom or non-effective things in that context, but more than that, a critical incident. And that's where I start this conversation and then I keep on the conversation when they are higher semesters. And I'm going to share here my screen so you can see a little bit what we base on. Um, this comes from the actual presentation that I use, I kind of transform it. Um, Every time I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on this presentation in any semester, and uh, the main idea is that they understand what they can focus on, whether something that was really effective in the classroom or something that was not effective. So we focus on the idea of critical incident, something that is significant for the teacher, an event that is making you stop and think because of any reason. It can be something apparently very trivial, very simple. But it may be the starting point of yourself uh, finding yourself in, in a situation in which you start to make questions about that apparently trivial thing, right? And, and it can lead you to even question your, your beliefs and your values, which are uh, something you come with uh, from before, something that you have uh, learned and developed through life. And there are certain incidents in the classroom that sometimes uh, challenge you in those kind of thoughts. So it can lead you to, to bigger, bigger change. Uh, and a critical incident, that's the main idea. It's something that, it's, that it becomes relevant for you. So how do you identify exactly that? How do you know uh, where, where to start? And then I show them a little bit. Uh, let me go forward in here. Uh, through a set of questions that may help you uh, start deciphering what is really relevant for you. What's going on in the classroom? <laughs> Very simple questions, right? But sometimes we don't even stop to, to ask ourselves that. What did I do? What did the student do in that situation? Uh, what was my feeling at that time? Is my feeling causing an impact? Or is my feeling causing me, uh, causing me to act differently in the classroom? What is making me feel that way? What is productive or what is non-productive in the classroom? What is the part that I enjoy the most or the part, the part that I didn't enjoy? What, what in my actual thought right now before actually reflecting, what I think is my, my best part in this class or what I think that I, that I must be improving right now? And that's even starting already the reflection. Abide, I'm sorry, can I ju jump in real quick? Yes. Looking at these questions here that you're posing for critical incidents, can uh, how many discussions that you had with your learners based around these questions and, and talking about identifying critical inc incidents comes from just a personal reflection after the class versus a recorded class that they refer to first before they have this discussion with you? Uh, come again. Uh, you were talking about uh, reflection, a uh, written reflection versus having a recorded class. Well, yeah. Okay. So I'm assuming either they're going to write a reflection for you, or right. they're going to have a conversation uh, with you about uh, a reflecting on this idea of critical incident and, and answering some of these questions that you're posing. So that's one scenario. Yeah. But I'm wondering if there's also not another scenario where. Uh, students have to, before they do the reflection or before they have a conversation with you, they first must look at a recording, a video or an audio recording 
where they analyze that recording before answering these questions or before having a discussion about identifying a critical incident. We do have recordings uh, in teaching workshop, and uh, but the thing in in that uh, in that specific case is that we have a, a reflective session immediately after they teach. So what I do there is that I, I uh, frequently go back to the videos and, and set them as a background of what we are discussing at that moment. And in some cases, we are actually looking at the, at the happenings in that moment during the reflective session. Uh, anyhow, there is not time enough as to go through the whole video or have, give them the opportunity to watch it by themselves. Uh, we start, we start uh, the reflection on whatever they can think of at that moment. And we go, um, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Uh, yes. let, let me show you, this is kind of a formalization that I came up with for this semester of uh, the reflection. I ask them in this section to jump into uh, some ideas to start um, uh, fitting me a little bit uh, with, maybe they don't have time to actually reflect deeply, but at least what they, want to discuss, what they want to discuss. And then during that reflective session immediately after the class, they have observers, classmates, and my comments. And the, and, and the idea of this format is that they actually do not forget to take notes about whatever is relevant for them. And, and finally, and this is a, a, a moment after this session, this is not in the moment of the reflective session, and this is where, in between, this is where I ask them to go back to the video and actually analyze what we are discussing in the reflection uh, at that moment, what we are mentioning. There are things sometimes that uh, they go in the class too fast. And so we discuss about them, but the homework is you've got to go through the video and you have to really analyze how was that part or what did you exactly do in that part. Sometimes myself is the one that I have to go back to the video afterwards because maybe I'm typing at that moment some comments and in my observation and I miss a couple of seconds of what the teacher is doing and it's a key aspect in the class. So we use a lot of the video, uh, but yes, now that you're mentioning, I think uh, uh, we do not have a formal session like the one we have in, uh, uh, in after the class, after they watch the video. Uh, but whatever they see in the video, it, they bring it up in further sessions, when planning again, maybe, when they have certain questions, when they are preparing their classes, this is not exactly the, ana the analysis of the, of the class that they're, that they're, I mean, I taught them the class and then we, we go through a reflection now. It's like, I'm planning for the following class, but I realize uh, through the comments we made and I already watched the video and I'm aware of this and that's when it comes in, in, in play. And, uh, and sometimes what I was looking at a, a moment ago, these questions, uh, there are more questions that I have here. What am I thinking about that moment? Why do I think, I mean, we have a lot of questions in here, but you don't even have to go through all of them. Maybe one of them, it's just the, the spark that sets you reflecting immediately about a critical incident. Now, uh, I use the word critical incidents because in medicine, they are talking about moments in life or moments that actually cause a serious huge impact. Uh, now at the classroom level, maybe not uh, life and death, like in medicine, uh, but, uh, but it, it may be still something that becomes really important because is when you start fossilizing in things that are non-effective or is where you start to actually uh, find a reason to learn and to develop yourself as a teacher, which is a key. If you don't find a reason to change anything in the classroom, if you don't see the importance, if you don't see the actual application in your life and your benefit, you're never gonna make a change. You're never gonna try to do it. But this is just the what, selecting the starting point. Afterwards comes the whole reflective process and, and well, that would be like another talk, but I think uh, uh, it took a little bit of time here, but um, but I think uh, it goes towards what you're asking exactly. How do you actually make them focus on what they may need to focus? Well, I, as I always tell them, I, sh I can show you the door, <laughs> uh, like, like a typical, um, stereotypical saying, 
but I cannot walk through it. They are the, the, themselves are the ones that have actually to to walk through it because if I just tell them, but they are not aware of how important that is or what exactly happened when they did it or when the happening occurred in the classroom, well, there's not going to be a case. Uh, there's, it's not going to be worth it that I mention it because it's just going to pass by. Right, and I'm thinking about these critical incidents and how much of it is emergent that is, you know, through your discussions, through your analysis, looking at the video and having the, the, these discussions with your teacher trainers, how much of these incident, incidents come and emerge through the conversation and through the analysis and, uh, of, of one's class versus those incidents that are almost, I, won't, I don't want to say predetermined, but things that they're already conscious of, that they're already kind of looking for already. And, and you know, maybe this is going to be the difference between maybe more experienced teachers versus novice teachers. How much of this awareness of what these uh, incidents can be... Uh, thought about beforehand, or maybe there, there's more of an awareness of those, maybe not the details, but that they're more aware of these certain issues versus almost totally emergent where you really have no idea until you actually start looking at the video and start thinking and reflecting in action about what happened at that particular moment. Do these incidents come, come up um, you know, in, in, one, in your discussion? But I think that uh, going back to uh, PAR and, and thinking about these critical incidents that you bring up, because I think this is, a, I, I think, an important piece of this reflective process. One of the prompts that I work a lot with, uh, with my learners when trying to come up with some sort of problem that they are to research and, and inquire about and reflect on later is a very simple sentence that I think forces us to think more specifically about a particular problem that would later form these critical incidents that you, that you talk about. Mm -hmm. And it's really looking at breaking down one sentence prompt or a one sentence prompt into three different sections. Mm -hmm. You first start with the topic. So I wish to learn more about it. So let's say you want to learn more about L1, L2 in the classroom because you relate to a problem in your own classroom that students are not speaking enough L2 or English in our case. So I wish to learn more about L1 and L2 in the classroom. That would be the topic. Then it goes into an indirect question beginning with, because I want to find out. Now here is where a more direct, more specific approach or idea needs to come up uh, through using one of the question words, how, why, when, where, what, with whom, thinking about a key question word that would provide the basis for a very specific type of indirect question. So if we're looking at L1 or L2 in the classroom, I wish to learn more about L1 or L2 in the classroom because I want to find out, you might state something like, because I want to find out how I, we'll put it, keep it in the first person since this is going to be a participatory action research, how can I, how can I promote L2 in the classroom through the use of, and I can fill in the blanks here, through the use of certain materials, through the use of certain technologies, through the use of certain te teaching techniques or learning strategies, and I fill in the blank here, uh, and I don't choose all of those, but I choose one of those that I want to think about, learn about, uh, reflect on, and even discuss this with possibly my, my colleagues. And this, this part of my prompt here that I'm sharing with you today is, I think, directly related to this critical incident that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. This indirect question that I formulate here is going to give me some preconceived ideas about the types of critical incidents that I'm going to be looking for later when I look at the video or the audio of the class that I just taught. And that's what that th this kind of leads me to the question that I posed a second ago is how much of your discussions with the critical about the critical incidents come from maybe a predetermined idea or you know, some sort of 
inclination of you know of some aspect of the critical incidents versus just blankly looking at a class saying okay I, I I'm not looking for anything in particular I'm just gonna watch my practice what I did in class today and then see if I can identify some sort of critical incident right right uh, it's difficult at the beginning uh, for some for some teachers but um, for some others it's pretty easy to 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 be aware of what they're actually doing uh, but I, I think in general most of them uh, they are not actually looking for a specific thing they are actually looking for uh, the first expectation is what I have to say about it they actually want me to tell them and they go immediately to the idea of was it good or was it bad and that's it they don't even care about the why at the beginning they don't see the importance of the why they just want to know did I did good or not so it's uh, it's a very uh, slow process sometimes because um, uh, they tend to I don't, I don't know if this is a consequence of a whole life in a system that works like that but they tend to focus on whatever I'm going to grade. So they want me to tell them exactly what to do and how I want it so they can get a good grade. And, uh, and it's not the way it works. Uh, it come, it, it, I need to uh, have a lot of questions always so they can exactly understand. The frequent answers I have when I ask questions is, I don't know. Uh, what do you think about this when you did this? Uh, I don't know. What do you, uh, how did you feel? I felt nervous. Why do you think you felt nervous? I don't have an idea. Uh, or very specific things like, um, uh, did you, did, did you uh, notice the process you follow in, when given instructions? Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, and they go through this. I, I don't know what, but I didn't like it. And then I ask, okay, why, why didn't you like it? I don't know. I mean, that's the most frequent answer, frequent answer I have with beginners and and through working well one of the things that helps us is that we do have uh input sessions in which they we explore uh, uh some aspects like for right now for example the following one that is this tuesday we're going to be talking about uh giving instructions and explaining uh to students when when needed right so they focus a little bit more on those ideas because those are the input sessions about in this case, this is going to be the topic for this for this round of, of teaching. Uh, but it, but we still explore a lot of aspects in general, and and I try to elicit from them uh, the aspects that I detect are the most effective ones or the non-effective ones in the classroom. And little by little, they start getting themselves into. In one semester, they start already to detect. Oh, I felt this work. I realized this work. I I saw my students reacting, and that made me feel really comfortable. I was really nervous at the beginning because I had a lot of things in my mind. They start to give you actually the whys, and and we start, and then from there we can actually explore and try new things. Yeah, I think this is where the um, like a stimulated recall really comes into play, and I think you know we can have conversations and reflect, but I think it goes back to this idea of trying to get as much data and information as possible, or going back to the videos or the audios. It's like, if they are looking more at those videos and audios and looking and thinking about what they're doing, mm -hmm. it's going to be much, it's going to be a, a much different experience than just simply trying to recall, like, because if they say, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. They can constantly go back to their description of what they see or what they hear from what they're doing in class. And through, it's almost like a Socratic method where you just get it out of them through the discussions of them describing what's going on first and then some sort of interpretation or opinion about the actions that they are that they're uh, looking at or they're that they're witnessing and i think that you know that talking about par whether we're experienced teachers or not it really looks it forces us to take a look at the hard data that is in front of us and make some sort of interpretation make some sort of 
uh, value judgment on on what we're doing. And we can, you know, as tutors or teacher trainers, we can, you know, try to tell them or we can say, oh, this is good or bad, but it's not, what's more important is their real, how they realize this and their awareness, how they come to realize what they later will interpret, if that makes sense. It's like they need to go through the process of understanding what exactly happened, first of all, and then they need to reach their own conclusions, you know, through maybe a guided discussion, but that they reach those conclusions themselves. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that there's certain things that we just can't tell them, you know, that they need to actually live and witness and experience themselves until they have that, their own aha moment where they finally see, oh, okay, I get it, or I see now what the problem is, or, yeah, I understand now the critical incident that took place in this particular class, et cetera. Yeah, I totally agree on that. I mean, they have to, to it's going to be way more significant if they find it by themselves. I'm, I'm sharing here my screen uh, to show you what we use, uh, the, work, the group we have in Facebook for this class. This is the, the beginners, the first time they teach. In fact, this is the, we are finishing the second round. I mean, the second time they actually teach simulated classes amongst themselves. And... Uh, and this is where we keep that we transmit live, obviously only for the group, uh, because at this point they are not really comfortable sharing outside. But uh, they record themselves, and you can actually see this is yesterday's class, and we already have ten reproductions of this. That means that means that ten of them already went through the video again to see to watch to analyze what happened, and. Uh, and if you see at the beginning of the semester, the, I mean, this is the second round. In the first round, the first classes, uh, I would go back to see how many of them have actually watched the videos. And very few of them, maybe one or two, or maybe it was myself that reproduced the video twice. <laughs> uh, but, um, but you can tell pretty much a pattern in here in which some of them have a lot of views. So maybe the same teacher is going... I mean, I'm just talking there here, right? I don't know, but but uh, there must be a reason why there are a lot of views on certain classes and on some others there are very few views. But in general, they are now leaning towards the idea of going back to their classes. They already have a, a reflective session, a reflection, feedback from tutor, feed, feedback from uh, their classmates, feedback from the simulated students also, and uh, they can come back and compare what it's been said in the sessions and analyze what they haven't really realized. Uh, so somehow there are things that they are told and then they come and, and check them. Or sometimes there are things that they are not told or we, are, we don't even discuss them and they can come and see it in here. Uh, the thing is that since it's a class and it's an integral uh, segment of a class, there's a lot of information to discuss, and sometimes there are things I just uh, uh, don't want to get too deep or I don't want to get through, and I mainly try to focus on what you say, what they have to say about it. So the first uh, sessions, we start mostly talking about how they felt in that sense, uh, because that's pretty much what they have in clear, uh, how nervous I was or how uncontrolled I was of my own feelings at that moment. But uh, the, after the first round, now in the second round, now we have more participation. And yesterday we even had a, a, a sort of discussion of some misinterpretation of what I said in a feedback session. And, but they actually uh, put it on the table because, because now they, they see what's the dynamic. They have watched the videos and then they put themselves on the table. All right, teacher, you said this last time, but now this happened and now you are saying the contrary. And then we went through this exploring, and uh, and even myself, I realized that sometimes I don't put the proper, I don't use the proper words in certain moments, and that may cause confusion. But uh, it's really important, and, and I go back to the main idea of what, of what you say. It's really important that we do have this kind of information, this kind of evidence, so they can actually, or, I mean, and myself, we all can go back and analyze it, and, and analyze all of this and see what happens. Last semester, uh, in a couple of, uh, of times, I had situations which worked really well, 
but I couldn't even tell at that moment what was it. I mean, for I think I discussed this in a prior in a prior uh, episode in which one teacher managed to give a lot of instructions, only spoken instructions in one mission, which normally uh, causes problems. But he managed to pull it through, and at that moment, my only comment in the feedback session was like, you know, uh, this is the first time I said this. Somebody speaking a lot, giving a lot of instructions, and the students getting it at the first time. And you didn't exemplify, you didn't perform step by step. The, the, I mean, you didn't give the instructions step by step. And and my, my comment in there is like, I've never seen this, and I'm not sure why it happened. I need to go back to the video. So this is something we have to discuss later on, not in this moment. So yes, the evidence that you gather and, 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 and the information you have, it's really, really important. And we go back to the idea of action research, right? Yeah, and, and I think one of the key points that I want to kind of wrap up with here today is really invite everyone, uh, regardless of how much experience you're having or that you have versus uh, novice teachers, maybe you're just getting into the field, but the importance of taking these examples that we've talked about today using video, for example, or audio, video, uh, video taping your class to see exactly what's going on in the class, something that um, I think it is, is necessary in order to be able to become more aware of certain aspects of, of your teaching based around a, a problem. Being uh, in touch with your students in the sense of finding ways to have students reflect and share those explicit thoughts on their experience that they have in your class. You know, and that's not always easy to do. I mean, it takes, you know, a certain degree of of openness and not taking things too personally to really be uh, take an honest look at what other t students feel about their their class instead of maybe just thinking well everything's uh, is fine um, but if you do it on a in a frequent enough basis i have found that uh, yeah, sometimes the comments are hard but if you get them frequently enough there's time to do something about it and when you present and, and you have an open communication with students from the very beginning that the reason for these reflections are to give this important information, I think they appreciate that and they, they will be honest. But if you come from a place of trying to be open to take in that feedback and try to do something about it and, be, and really bring that back to the discussion with your students, um, I think it's, I have found personally that it has really changed, I think, the dynamic of my classes and that it, uh, I certainly, for me personally, it's, it's allowed me to, you know, make quicker adjustments to my own teaching practice based on the particular group that I, that I have. Even if it's a class that I've taught many times, um, it's, every class is different, every group is different, every dynamic it, even every lesson is different. So it really uh, has helped to have that communication and be able to make those types of adjustments. And the only way I can do that, and the only way anyone can do that, is to find ways to get the information, whether it, again, it's, it's some sort of questionnaire, it can be online or, or something written out that you are sharing with your students, a videotape, but find those ways to collect the information, do some form of analysis, and most importantly, share it with other teachers. You know, and, and not just keeping it to your to yourself, but sharing that experience, that feedback with other teachers to start another conversation that, you know, leads to more of a community based uh, solution, you know, to these problems that we face, you know, every day. Yeah, my last comment about this would be uh, very related to what you are saying. Uh, I always tell my, my teachers that they have to earn the right. When they want to solve an issue with, or a situation with their students, they have to earn the right. They want respect in the classroom, they have to earn respect in the classroom. They want to gain their attention for actually something they want to show them. Uh, they have to earn the right to get their attention. They want students working constantly in the classroom and and um, and working all along, not uh, uh, not being um, uh, apathic to the class. 
the teacher has to learn the right in a certain way. And here, it's a case in point in which is the same situation with me and them. We have to, I have to earn the right to have this kind of communication. So they are open to exploring, analyzing, receiving feedback, giving feedback, putting out their opinion, because it's really important, uh, not just to, to, they mention the situation and then you tell them about the situation, no. We need to know their own opinion, what they really think about it, because sometimes what they think is totally contrary to uh, what you are actually trying to, to make, the point you are tr actually trying to make. But sometimes their view also affects a little bit the way you are putting things in front of them. So what I mean is you have to establish yes, this communication and this sharing so they can feel open. And this is the first job that you have with them, that I have with them at the beginning of the semester. And I'm really glad that, for example, this semester, this is the second round, and I think we are way on track already for sharing and saying the things and openly talking about the effective and non-effective things. And they actually telling me what they are getting uh, from what I try to put on the table. Uh, and uh, one of the indicators of this is that at the beginning, the first class, they're all concerned about the grades. And they always want to know about the grades. And they tend to do that. This semester is the second round, and in the first round they were not really, they, in the first round they were concerned about the grades. In this second round, just one student have asked me about what they got as a grade. From the actual session of feedback, they get the total filling, and they don't even, uh, at, at this point, they know how I grade. We, have a, we had a session uh, about the rubric I'm using, I made it clear, but I think the feeling and, and, and the, the communication we established and this relationship that we are building led us to the idea that it's something that we have to do, but it becomes kind of secondary because we all, the 18 teachers that I have right now with me, they are all actually working in uh, what we agree to work as a team little by little. Yeah, I think maybe the issue of giving grades uh, is a different discussion, but a very important one that maybe we can dive in at another time and kind of get some of the uh, specifics about that. Because I see that also being very relevant to in-service teachers who maybe are working at a school where this type of uh, interaction, this type of reflection could also be part of the teacher evaluation. Yes. And how does that convert to teacher evaluation again, which is another a very important discussion yeah. that I have a lot of thoughts on. Yeah, different uh, About how to convert this same experience of open collaboration, cooperation through PAR uh, and and linking that to teacher evaluation. So, right. yeah, that's, that's going to be, I'm making a note to myself and uh, yeah. at some point in the future, we definitely will dive into that because I yeah. think that's going to be another very uh, i will be very afraid to but uh, book me up for that <laughs> yeah yeah no, it's something that we need to yeah to dive into okay okay um i think we'll stop there pd a great talk here today on participatory action research i want to thank everyone who uh, joined us live especially those in facebook who come in and uh pop in and out we certainly appreciate that also those who have watched this recording if you want to reach out to us, you want to be part of the conversation, again, feel free to let us know. Reach out to us privately or send us a public message through Facebook. We have a, a page dedicated to Teacher Learning Cast. So, yeah, definitely let us know if there are topics that you want to know more about or if you want to join us uh, Saturday morning to discuss uh, educational topics that, that you face. Yes, let me thank the guys that joined us in Facebook Live for a while. We got Carlos Herrera, we got Mauricio Lozano, uh, we got also Ricardo Vasquez, who joined us every week, Suhey Salas, uh, Marco Antonio, Rico Medina, Elsa Collazo, Alex Hernandez, Ángeles Alvarado, Galicia Alvarado, Gerardo Jasso, Eddie Valdez, Andrea García, Andres Perales, uh, myself watching. <laughs> um, Oh, my dear Ken Shinobi, he's a, he's a wrestler in Mexico City, and he was also watching for a while. Lesia Valero and Rico Medina join us today. Thank you very much for joining us. We would invite you to actually jump into the Hangout and say something.
Yeah, and also feel free to post. Yeah, if you're joining us in the uh, Facebook uh, feed, yeah, post questions. Pity's constantly checking those so we can field questions during the live broadcast, which would be which is uh, another way that you can uh, participate. But I think we'll stop there. Petey, thanks a lot for this uh, interesting talk. Enjoyed it. And thanks, everyone, for uh, watching. And we'll see everyone next week in Teacher Learning Cast. Keep on learning. Mm -hmm.